Hi, and welcome to the set of About the Authors TV. I'm your host, Jake Brown. We're excited to share with you a preview of a few of the upcoming episodes starring the best-selling authors in the world that you'll see in full this winter on seasons one and two of About the Authors TV. Thanks for watching. We hope you enjoy. I did know that uh, when I decided to write a, a, a character who was a lawyer, I thought, well, because I'm, you know, I, I knew the culture, I worked in a big firm, I sort of understood some of the dynamics. I thought it, it, it's really challenging for people who don't have a certain pedigree, who, uh, you know, in Kate's instance, what would be the most embarrassing thing to deal with or the most the thing that you would feel the most uncomfortable about. And that would be either you're a criminal or you're, you know, your, your father is a notorious criminal, which is what happened to Kate. And then, but you know, I also thought she needs to live, that's not her fault. Like that, that's not a crime that, you know, she, I think one of the themes in my books is, you know, the sins of the father. Like, how do you, how are you defined by that? And, and can you move past it? But for Kate, she also has the fallout of the sins of her father is she, something happened to her and she did something that she, you know, has haunted her. And this is this car accident with her sister. So it's like tragedy upon tragedy. And I think, you know, I think people relate to that because that, that can happen. You know, there's all these unintended consequences of one act. And, um, and I thought it was an interesting thing to do to show it in somebody who um, is representing justice, you know, in that sense, you know, they are the face of it. They are the people who help other people or steer them in, in other ways. So that is kind of how I came up with Kate. Um, the name Kate, it's interesting because I, I, I know I realize for myself as a writer, I tend to stay away from names that are too complicated. I also felt it was a name that was fairly universal in other languages. Um, and it's simple. Kate you know, Lang, you mean as a- Yeah, yeah, but even just the first name, I usually come up with my first names. I have noticed I have a tendency to have names with A's in them, <laughs> just for whatever reason I do, but um, it's, Naming is really important and really challenging for me. Like I need the name, I need the title, I need the name. I, it, 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 it gives me, there's, some, there's significance to them for me that helps me with when I'm writing. It gives me a world, it gives me a context. Yo Manson was another one. Uh, it was that they were teaching at Quantico and, and there were LAPD cops in the class sometimes and they, uh, they would say, no, your facts are wrong, Mr. So-and-so. You got, I mean, so we're in California. We used to do road schools in those days. That means you go out for two weeks at a time, just like in the show Mine Hunter. You spend a week maybe in Boise, Idaho, and you got a week LA, LAPD or, or regionally LAPD and LASO. Let's go, let's go interview uh, you know, Manson. The big thing about Manson was, and he did a great job in the show, uh, the Mine Hunter show, is he's a little guy. And now I'm six feet two again. You know, now what I what these guys are doing and what they, when they perpetrate their crimes too, it's all about power and control. I have to give them this sense of power control over me. Even Kemper, as big as, as, big as he is, I have to kind of go back and, and lean back. With, with Manson, I knew damn well that he was going to probably want to stand over me. So we made sure we had a credenza in, in the interview environment so that he, during the interview, what he could do is is get up on top of the credenza. Why did I know that? Because when, when he was at the George Smond Ranch uh, teaching his followers, uh, he would sit up on top of a rock and, and preach to them or play his guitar to them. So he comes walking in, little guy, real real charismatic, but he, he would like us. Unlike some of the interviews you may see on YouTube of him, well, he'll just manipulate reporters like up and down and, and journalists. We had the facts of the case. We knew we knew the case, and, and what's weird to probably somebody watching, we'll be laughing with these people. We'll, we'll, we'll make light of certain things. We're trying to project this false empathy, but I, I'm on, and the mission is to gain knowledge and information. And, and the only way, I can't be doing that is, oh, you should, they should have executed you, oh, you're disgusting. No, 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 I have to, 
I have to you know, walk in the shoes of, of, this, uh, of these individuals. So Manson comes in, sure enough, sits up on top, on top of the band. So, and now we're, we're like the followers watching, you know, watching him and he's going to lecture us. But, but I, I soon found out with him, he, he was never busted for uh, you know, being a killer. He's not, people have heard him a serial killer. He's not, he wasn't a serial killer. He may have killed, they never got him on a, on a homicide. They got him on con conspiracy, but he was a fantastic manipulator, and and he wasn't an attractive guy. Which uh, you know, just it just kind of would mesmer mesmerize you. You know, speaking with him, he would send like Tex Watson out to do some of the recruiting. He was a better looking guy and bringing him back. But what he would do was he knew these kids. He was a profile of Manson. A lot of these killers are profiles. He knew that they were running away from their families, the, the God Almighty dollar during that period of time in, in the sixties looking for something outside of, of uh, money and fancy homes and cars. And here he gets drift right, he gets out of prison. He's at San Quentin and he's, and he's in he, Ashbury and he's at San Francisco and he sees all these that make love about war is perfect for him. Plays a little bit guitar here. So he knew he would have sex when he'd have sex with these victims. He would have them, uh, uh, not, they didn't have victims and family members. Uh, he would have them fantasize and, and, and he would script them, we call scripting, to talk that, that they're having sex with their father. And it's, so he could maintain his dominance. And he would drug him up somewhat, but he would not take any drugs himself, or, or maybe marijuana. He, why, again, because he had to be you know, in control. So he was an excellent interview and, and, and from learning, because then you could see you know, later on, you, you could see cases like David Koresh and Ruby Ridge, that, that, that charismatic leader, you can see that, or Jim Jones in Guyana, you know, how someone like that could have, have followers. And the one thing too, and your, your viewers and listeners have to understand, there are different types of serial killers. They, everyone wants to put them like in one category. He was a more of a mission-oriented assassination style of a serial killer, kind of like jo Joseph Paul uh, Franklin. He didn't come in contact, didn't touch the victims. Interesting if they were parked in a lover's lane area in a vehicle, he would approach on, on the, the, the victim side, the woman's side, not the, not the driver's side. He'd kill them both, but he, he would approach, uh, you know, on that uh, on that side. When I interviewed him at Attica, uh, at, at, which is a, that's the other thing. These prisons are not necessarily like like what you see on television. Yeah, I even mind Hunter itself. These are very intimidating uh, environments when you go in there, and and you're oftentimes you're walking among the inmates. You you're there. And they're looking at you. They say, Look at this guy. Like, what do you think he's a? He looks like a fed. He he's an AFK. Yeah, I think I think he's, he's a uh, he's a defense attorney. That's what you hope. You're thinking that you're a defense attorney. You're to help you, boys. You know. <laughs> you know so you're walking. You're walking among them. So we get to a, we get to a uh, a cell, and and now they they bring in Berkowitz. And the first shocking thing with him was his eyes, real blue, blue, uh, blue eyes. He's looking like this. Me and my partner back, you know, back and forth like that. I introduce myself and say, hey, I said, we're, we're conducting research here. We're trying to uh, help law enforcement throughout the country. Uh, we've done some you know, other interviews here. The warden knows we're here, that you're, you're hopefully going to be cooperating with us. It could help you in time, David, you know, something. And, and so he's looking to see whether or not I'm BSing them or not. Because when I'm talking, he's looking at my part and see what kind of nonverbal he's giving off here. And so he's kind of hemming and hawing. And then finally, I said, you know something, David? I, I said, like 100 years from now, nobody's going to know me, John Douglas, or my partner, Bob Ressler. 100 years from now, and I, and I take out the New York Daily News. My, my dad was a printer and president of the typographical union in New York. He gave his uh, son of Sam terrorizes New York City. And he's looking at that. I said, 100 years, no one's going to know us, but everyone will remember you, David, the son of Sam. So matter of fact, David, right now, in Wichita, Kansas, and I said, I just uh, did a case for them. And it's known as the BTK Strangler, Find, Torture, and Kill. And you know, in his letters, he's taunting the police, he's sending letters to the press. He's referencing me. Uh, you know, he, he, he's, uh, you know, referencing me in the letters. Call me something. You got the son of Sam in New York. Call me something. Like, BTK, Find, Torture, Kill. Give me a name. And so I, as, as I'm saying all this, he just lights up. And because now I made this inadequate nobody, this nobody guy, a somebody, I made him somebody and, it, and gave him this feeling, you know, of, of importance. 
So then he opens up, they, they start opening up, we start talking about early childhood, uh, what precipitated this, uh, you know, he, he was adopted, didn't know he was adopted, finds his, his true mother of Long Beach, Long Island, after serving a couple of years in, in the army, who knows what he did when he was serving time in, uh, you know, in the army. And uh, it just opens things up. But you see, I'm, I'm armed with a lot of information. If, if I'm not, if I'm not, if I'm a reporter, a journalist, a, a investigator, they're gonna, they're gonna test you. Once they test you, they're gonna manipulate you. It was certainly the better of the two results I could have faced had I lost the case. I think I would have had great trouble getting any criminal cases interacting. People would say, well, what's this punk kid stepping in a first degree murder for? I had been sought out by an author who covered the case. He worked for the Chicago Tribune. <clears throat> he was also a lawyer. And he wrote a bestseller called The Shepherd Murder Case. He came to the Polygraph Institute, where by that time, as a result of the first case, they couldn't find any lawyers either to teach legal aspects of polygraphy. And he came over to the school and said, you got a lawyer who works here that might be willing to take on a tough case. And they said, well, we got a lawyer who in our bed is to take on anything. But, so he said the Shepherd family would like to meet me for the sole purpose of getting a commutation. And I took the book with me and flew to Cleveland. By the time I got to Cleveland, I'd finished the book. It was clear to me beyond any doubt this guy could not have committed the murder in two, indeed two justices uh, of the Ohio Supreme Court had said the state proved him innocent with their own evidence. Well, that was pretty inspiring stuff. So I just said, Sam, one way or another, I'm gonna get you out of here. And sure enough, and he didn't believe, oh, I was far too young to even be sitting there, let alone getting him out of a sentence he'd done for 10 years, not at all, because I see being scared of military flight training. They almost killed me twice. You had to worry much about cops, lawyers, and judges. Uh, these guys are deadly and they didn't get you. Covering the Philadelphia mob from, I guess, 1980s through the, the turn of the century, saw so kind of an evolution or a devolution of the organization. Angelo Bruno was the boss from 1959 to 1980, very docile. He succeeded eventually by Nicky Scarpo, who's a psychopath. Scarpo succeeded by John Staffa, who in his own right is a psychopath. Now, Staffa, you have to remember, John Staffa was born and raised in Sicily, came to this country as an adult, was a made guy in the mafia in, in Sicily before he even came here. So he had a different kind of mindset. So when I'm writing about him in the 1980s, 1990s, uh, you know, and he's got a, a food distribution warehouse in South Philadelphia, and he's got a business. And whenever I was going to be writing a story about him, I'd call up the business and say, this is Anastasia. I want to talk to Stamp about blah, blah. They'd hang up the phone. Finally, it pissed him off. And eventually, he told somebody, find out where Anastasia lives, get some hand grenades, throw them in his window. So he put a hit out on me. Now, Scarpo didn't like me. Bruno didn't care. For, I mean, they would never think of doing that because they were, they were Americanized. And they realized if you, if you attack a reporter, you create more problems than you solve. But John Stamper came from Sicily, and in Sicily, everybody's in play. Prosecutors, journalists, if you're not with them, you're against them. And, and it's a very kind of violent uh, one side or the other world. So that's the jam I was in when that, now I don't know that's going on. I'm not aware it's going on. I don't find out about this till much after the fact. Stampa and several of his associates are indicted. They're arrested. One of them is a young guy named Sergio Battaglia, 30-year-old kid. He's, and, and he's looking at life in prison. He raises his hand and he agrees to cooperate. They start to debrief him. Now I'm at my office at the Inquirer and I get this phone call. And I, I used to get this a lot, collect phone calls from prison. Will you accept the call? Naturally, I'm accepting. I, he said, this is Sergio Battaglia. I want to let you know uh, I'm cooperating and there's some stuff going to come out about you. And then he tells me this story. He says, you know, uh, you know, it's nothing personal, he said, but I was supposed to get some hand grenades, throw them in your window. And, and I said, Sergio, Hand grenades through my window, very personal. You know, I have a wife and two kids. He said, well, by the time I got the hand grenades, we were so caught up in the war with the other faction of the mob that we stopped looking for you. So, I mean, that's the only time I had a problem. And I think it was 
very much unique because of who Stanford was, that Sicilian mentality. And it, and it you know, it, I thank, obviously, obviously it never happened, I'm standing here talking to you, but that's the only time I think I had any real jeopardy and, and I didn't learn about it till after the fact. So it didn't have a really great impact on, on what I was doing. 